Good, good evening, everybody. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? No? Can you hear me? No. Yes, you can. Yes. Good evening and um, welcome to Morgan Priory. Um, on behalf of the Friends, can I welcome you all? I'm Anne Eglinton, for those of you who don't know me, and currently chairman of the Friends. Um, we are thrilled to have Piers Maxim with us um, and a group of singers uh, for our Heritage and Faith lecture. A couple of housekeeping things. Uh, first, before we start, um, if there's an emergency, we hope there's not. This building's been here for a thousand years and we're hoping it's going to be here for another thousand years. But if there's an emergency, stay in your seats and Jerry Custos will give you instructions of how to evacuate the building. There is more than one entrance. There are three, three exits, so he will point you in the right direction with the stewards, so stay in your seats. And if you need a toilet at uh, any point, there are two toilets in the north porch, which is the main door where you came, came in. So we're really looking forward to hearing and learning a bit more about the music and worship that's gone on in this beautiful building, which continues to today. Um, and we're thrilled that Piers is, is talking to us. He is the director of music at Morven Priory and we are thrilled with the choir. They sing for us on Sundays and the standard is amazing. So um, thank you very much for coming, Piers. And I will hand over to our vicar Rod who will just say a short prayer, a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. We're certainly in for a treat tonight, I'm sure. In a moment, I'm going to pray, but let me just read a uh, verse from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. St. Paul writes, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of music. That music has been rooted in the Christian tradition ever since it began, ever since our Lord was here on earth. Lord, this church throughout the centuries has been filled with worship and praise, with music that has reached the roof and beyond to heaven. And so, Lord, we praise your name for that wonderful gift. Now, tonight, we ask that you will be with peers and the singers as they take us on a journey through the years, through the changes, through the exciting times of music here in this beautiful building, Great Malvern Priory. Lord, be with peers and all who take part today. S dispel all nerves, and may what is said and done be to your glory. Amen. Amen. Lovely. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Rod, for that welcome. It feels like home anyway. It is lovely to be here. So wonderful to see so many of you as well. And you're all friendly faces, so that's great. So a thousand years of music and worship at Great Morven Priory. Well, it's a, a great honor and a privilege to be asked to give this Heritage and Faith Lecture this year. I've been director of music since 2012 already. So a very small part of the nearly a thousand years of music and worship. My title does demand, however, a few caveats before I begin. Now, obviously, we are not quite a thousand years. Um, much of my musical supposition is just that. It is conjecture, really, until we reach the Victorian age, when we know that there was an organ and a robed choir. However, for the first 450 years of the Priory's life, this building, or at least this part of it, was a Benedictine Priory. And so we can be pretty certain about the type of music and worship that was offered up to God during that time. So 1085, 
gosh, I mean, that's 19 years after 1066, isn't it? Um, 19 years after William the Conqueror. And I have a lovely little whimsical thought that those 19 years earlier, before 1085, someone may have crossed the channel with William and then come here and built these pillars. These pillars are original. Sometime, perhaps, when no one's looking, go and hug it, because, I mean, it is just quite extraordinary to think of the history in these very pillars. A lot of the rest of the building was built later, as you know, but these pillars are quite extraordinary. We do know there's a direct link from Edward the Confessor and Westminster Abbey, which was consecrated in 1065, because uh, Bishop Woolston of Worcester received a charter from William the Conqueror. He, in turn, asked Aldwin to build a priory on this site. And so Westminster Abbey, being a Benedictine monastery, led to the priory here being founded as a Benedictine priory as well. Let me briefly run through what the Benedictines would offer up as worship each day. They had between six and eight hours or offices, services. Um, and these were called various names, but these are the ones that are generally known to have been used at the time. Matins, of course you'll know of Matins in the cathedrals these days. Lords, Prime, Terse, Sext, Known, Vespers and Compline. Compline was at the end of the day and completed the services. They started at before daybreak and they ended at sunset. Now the third to the sixth service, that's Prime, Terse, Sext, and known were simple and unadorned services of around 20 minutes and they would have had the following order a greeting a hymn three psalms a chanted sp scriptural passage a short response and a brief dismissal and actually jilly and i and the family were in the isle of wight for our summer holidays and we popped into quor abbey which is the benedictine abbey there and we were just in time for the Angelus and for Sext at one o'clock. The monks came in, ignored us, sitting down there, the lay people, came in, did their bit, they sang their psalms, they sang their scriptural uh, reading, and then they left. It was absolutely gorgeous, about 15, 20 minutes worth. And that's been going on for the thousand years, certainly, uh, following the rule of Benedict. So the hymn at the beginning of that list of music, it's not quite the hymn as we know it, but an ancient non-scriptural text with words attributed to the likes of Ambrose of Milan from the fourth century. A hymn sung at Sext might have been Yam Sexta Sensim Volvitur, which is talking about this is now the sixth hour. While a hymn heard at Compline could have been Telucis Antiterminum, before the ending of the day. Now this is still sung in this church during our Compline services during Advent and during Holy Week. So we are going to sing for you now uh, one of the uh, Ambrosian hymns, Christe qui lux es et dies. I'll give you a little translation of some of it. We'll sing two verses. Christ, who art the light and day, you drive away the darkness of night. You are called the light of light, for you proclaim the blessed light. Christe qui lux es et dies.
Now, Ambrose himself was not unaware of his own talents. This is what he's quoted as saying. They also say that the people are led astray by the charms of my hymns. Certainly, I do not deny it. <laughs> it is interesting to note that John of Salisbury, who was Bishop of Chartres in the 12th century, wrote, Music sullies the divine service, for in the very sight of God, in the sacred recesses of the sanctuary itself, the singers attempt with the lewdness of a lascivious singing voice and a singularly foppish manner <laughs> to feminize all their spellbound little followers with the girlish way they render the notes and end the phrases. I don't think we sang like that, did we? No. To be fair, this was at a later date when the likes of Lernin and Perrotin of Notre Dame in Paris were adding extra notes to the simple plain chant lines so that duplum was sung. This is where you have two consecutive lines in harmony with one singer singing up to 40 notes while the other singer sang one note. <laughs> that this was the forerunner of polyphony about which a little later. Of course, the arguments still continue today about whether music is an, an enhancement or a hindrance to music. Don't forget it was St. Augustine who said, of course, he who sings prays twice, though I have always found that somewhat excluding. Back to our Benedictine office, which would have been heard in this priory. The psalms were sung in a weekly cycle, so that all the 150 psalms were sung each week. They were sung responsorially, that is with a cantor, and then the others joining in, or antiphonally, from side to side and would have been preceded and followed by an antiphon, a verse often drawn from scripture, which is relevant to the current liturgical season. We're gonna sing for you now a psalm with its preceding antiphon. We'll just sing four verses though. And the antiphon is repeated at the end after the Gloria Patri. So we'll sing the antiphon Pacificus, and the words are, he shall be called peaceable, and his throne shall be most firm forever. And then we'll sing the first four verses in the Gloria of Dixit Dominus, Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand.
And so, during the first 450 years of the Priory's existence, these wonderful, timeless sonorities were heard in praise of our Lord, offered up on an almost hourly basis by the Benedictine monks. Whether they were disturbed by the newest fads in music cannot be known for sure. However, with hospitality being one of the most important doctrines for Benedictine monasteries, it is very possible that guests may have brought new ideas with them and introduced them to the monks. Indeed, some of these ideas were being nurtured and even written down not so far from here, at the Benedictine Cathedral Priory of Worcester. A collection of manuscripts from the late 13th to early 14th centuries called the Worcester Fragments has survived and is a gold mine for anyone wishing to discover what vocal music was being sung in the priories and monasteries up and down the land at that time. Here you'll see a, a fragment of the fragment. Again, I must add the proviso that we do not know if the monks of Morven Priory were sufficiently adept at their singing to have undertaken such singing in their offices, even if they knew such music existed, but it may have been possible. <clears throat> now in brief, the first move away from what is called monodic music, where there is one melodic line, such as in the plain chant you just heard, was by adding the same line a fourth or a fifth degree higher or lower. This leads to what is called organum. And three of us are now going to try and show you some organum. Um, first of all, Richard in the tenor will sing his line. We're going to sing Victime Pascali, which is an 11th century sequence for Easter Sunday, so it may well have been sung here. To the Paschal Lamb, let Christians offer up their songs of praise. The Lamb has redeemed the sheep, are the words in translation. Richard will sing it, then I will sing a fifth above, and then Malcolm will sing a fourth below, and then the three of us will sing together, and you'll get this wonderful timeless sonority called Organum. wonderful if I may say I think it, it's almost almost modern in some ways isn't it, it sort of comes around circular ancient music and, uh, and modern music over time the singers realized they could harmonize with sweeter intervals rather than the fourth and the fifth they could harmonize with the third and the sixth interval still often moving in consecutive or parallel motion this brought about music such as you'll hear now, uh, which also comes from the Worcester Fragments. So uh, Nick Malcolm and I will sing Beata Viscera Maria Virginis, Blessed be the womb of the Virgin Mary, who heavy with the fruit of the eternal seed in the cup of life pledges for us and for our sins a draught of sweetness.
Some of you may have heard there a few moments which did almost sound modern. That would have been when Malcolm sang what we now term a B flat. So to avoid the tritone. Now the tritone is the interval of tones, two notes, uh, which are three whole tones apart. So that would be la, 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 la. If you know your sassons, you might recognize that as a sign of the devil as well. And this was seen to be the devil's work and was called Diabolus in music, in musica, and was to be avoided at all costs. Around the same time, there emerged a style of singing called hocket, where the rhythm of a vocal line was passed from one voice to another. Here's a short example from a sequence for the Feast of Epiphany. Um, Epiphanium Domino Canamus Gloriosum, which, I'm singing about a flaming fire out of Jacob, will smite the host of Moab to his utmost coast. It's actually quite difficult to do, you might have noticed. Um, pocket, what does that mean? The etymology of it is um, from the French and even the Gaelic, and it means a hiccup or, or a sudden interruption. And you sort of heard that from us there, didn't you? Um, a few words now about uh, our spectacular windows installed around 1501, where we're sort of approaching that date in our chronology. The great Magnificat window over there in the north transept has many beautiful depictions of musicians. And this slide, and I do thank Catherine Little for her wonderful photos, shows two angels playing a lute and a harp. Can't see all the lute there at the bottom, but that's what the angel is playing there. And it would therefore appear that these instruments certainly were known in the Priory at the time of the window's installation. And the next slide there, we see the harp and the hurdy-gurdy, a sort of early form of the hurdy-gurdy. We're just missing the angel's right hand. This one, the angel on our right, as you're looking, um, the right hand is turning the handle um, of, of the hurdy-gurdy. And then with his left hand, he's playing keys. Were these instruments played in the Priory at the time? Well, it's certain that they were being played in secular society at the time. Now, you remember our example of Hockett just now, there must have been some monks who were not so adept at singing. Just as, may I say, there are some priests today who prefer not to sing the responses. In the 14th century, William Langland of local peers Plowman fame condemned clergy who could not sing or who did not regularly read from the lives of the saints either. In the parish churches during the 15th century, Further staff were employed to assist worship, including singers and organists. So it is possible that following the Black Death in the 14th century, when the number of monks here was reduced to 10, lay clerks or boys might have been brought in to bolster the singing, as happened in the parish churches and the cathedrals. Now, if this was the case, it would have allowed polyphony to have been sung on special occasions, such as Sundays and feast days. Now we're going to sing for you something now with a, the first time you're going to hear the ladies here on the top line um, by Christopher Tye. His dates are 1505, we think, 
to around 1573. And what I want you to listen out for are these little, they're called imitative entries, where one voice sings one pattern and another follows it. This is what's known as polyphony and starts to be heard around this time. We're going to sing Laudate Dominum. It's Psalm 112, praise the name of the Lord. In fact, this last piece denotes a huge sea change in church music, as of course in church history. It was a contrafactum, which is where different words are set to an existing tune, um, of an English work by Christopher Tye. And that English work was from his 1553 work, The Acts of the Apostles, in English, dedicated to the King's Most Excellent Majesty. This leads us neatly into the Reformation, following the dissolution of the Priory in 1539. From that time till now, the church has been the parish church of Malvern, and therefore the music within its walls has not followed the prescribed offices and services of the Catholic Benedictine order, but probably mirrored the tastes and directions of secular music making, more or less. Now, we're next going to sing for you a very well-known work from the mid-16th century by the great Thomas Tallis. There he is. He's either left-handed or we've got the uh, thing the wrong way around. <laughs> um, he, along with his great younger contemporary, William Byrd, bridged over that great divide between Catholic and Protestant music-making, both treading a fine and dangerous line between adherence to the current monarch's wishes and their own religious inclinations. So we're going to sing for you one you may well know, If Ye Love Me.
there is such a great wealth of music from the mid 16th century, um, from the Tudor period, it is fascinating to recognize that these musicians survived by moving with the times, composing in English when necessary, and even translating pieces from Latin to English according to the vagaries of the time. And now, if all my examples of music during the first 450 years of this priory were conjecture, this is still the case, really, for the most recent 500 years, did parish music making in the priory actually manage to keep up with the current trends? With the arrival of the Samuel Green organ in 1816, we can hazard a more confident guess at the kind of repertoire undertaken by the organist and his musicians. But between the time of the parishioners buying the building for 20 pounds and the early 19th century, we have to rely on what we know was happening in similar parish churches. Sadly, we also know that the priory was in a terrible state of repairs during the 18th century. And so music in worship was likely to have been mediocre at best. In all likelihood, however, Marbeck's setting of the New English text of the 1549 Book of Common Prayer would have been heard in this place in those early years. You will probably know some of the communion setting ser uh, service settings yourselves and will now sing the creed in its original, unaccompanied and unison form.
now let us imagine that from time to time the vicars of the priory managed to persuade some itinerant musicians to play and sing for a service or indeed the choir of our local cathedral may have sung a service or two the music of the cathedrals from the time of the reformation until the restoration was actually in a good state with cathedral organists taking their lead from the chapel royal and westminster abbey where there were such composers as Tallis and Bird, followed by Gibbons, Pelham Humphrey, Blow and Purcell. While it is unlikely that these walls would have resounded to the sounds of a broken consort of vials and a chamber organ, accompanying verse anthems by, say, Orlando Gibbons, the parishioners may well have heard one or two of his unaccompanied anthems, which are still very popular today. For example, we often sing his anthem here, Almighty and Everlasting God. It is not such a large step, musically speaking, to go from Orlando Gibbons to the great composer of the end of the 17th century, the short-lived Henry Purcell, who died in 1695. His anthems are still very well known, and we regularly sing, Remember Not Lord Our Offences, as well as Thou Knowest Lord, and his bell anthem, Rejoice in the Lord Alway. But it would be remiss of me, within the context of a lecture on English church music in any venue, not to sing a little Henry Purcell. Indeed, many believe this next piece to be his single greatest work, even if it is now believed to be only a fragment. We're going to sing for you Hear My Prayer, which is an eight-part uh, unaccompanied piece, and it is just the most glorious. You've got these various lines playing against each other. And if I remember rightly from uh, my Cambridge uh, lectures given by P.G. Le Hurin, the most wonderful expert on this sort of music, the end of the manuscript looks as though it was meant to continue. You know, they wrote manuscript in those days themselves, and there was some empty manuscript after this finished. And some people have posited the idea that actually he got to the end and went, hmm, I'm not sure I can follow that. So we're going to sing Hear My Prayer by Purcell. <clears throat> Following Purcell in the timeline of English church musicians, one has to mention that great English composer Georg Friedrich Händel. 
In fact, he did take on British nationality by means of an Act of Parliament in 1727, so we are allowed to adopt him. Again, it's unlikely that the Malvern parishioners would have heard any of the splendid orchestrally accompanied oratorios in this place. And Handel's music for worship in church is remarkably small, only the so-called Shandos anthems, and only one of those was originally written for organ accompaniment for the Chapel Royal. But there were other Georgian composers of note, such as William Boyce, who is organist at St Paul's Cathedral. Here is a delightful duet from his larger anthem, Turn Thee Unto Me, O Lord. So we are going to sing now The Sorrows of My Heart by William Boyce. As mentioned above, really, with the same with Handel, it's unlikely that was heard, but it could have been in the Priory. We can conjecture that there were probably a collection of local people who would have sung the services, mainly services of the word rather than Eucharistic services, and they would have been accompanied by any instruments then available. Here you can see a clarinet, uh, the pre boehm clarinet, those of you who know your woodwind instruments there on our left, and on the right a bassoon and a cello, and various singers, I'm not sure what they're telling the conductor there, perhaps he's gone on too long or something, um, and the singers, they're all singing from the same hymn sheet, which is good to see, it's the same size book, isn't it, and the musicians have bigger books, um, and I think that's up in a gallery somewhere. Um, the music would have been rather raucous, uh, probably not so different from the music heard in the local taverns. This type of music is called West Gallery music, and the repertoire comprised metrical psalms, anthems, and fuguing tunes, which are a bit like rounds and catches. One of the more famous of these we still sing from time to time, and it's the Cranbrook, Cranbrook tune for Wild Shepherds Watched Their Flocks. So we're going to have a go at that now. We decided not to put in um, sort of mummerset accents, so uh, forgive us for that. We might sound a bit plummy. Thank you. 
During the next century, the 1800s, music was at a low ebb in the cathedrals and churches up and down the country and received the much needed injection of energy from Samuel Sebastian Wesley in his various organist posts around the country, including nearby Hereford, where he wrote his famous Easter Day anthem, Blessed Be the God and Father. Here in the Priory, we are able to see that the old was being moved out for the new when the new organ, and they said it was the new organ, was installed in 1816, and this replaced the psalm singers. There is mention of a pair of organs in a priory inventory in 1552, but nothing else is known about the organ from that time until the early 19th century. Now, central to the change in church music, alongside the use of an organ to accompany the congregation, was the publishing in 1861 of hymns ancient and modern. This formalised the main singing that was going on in the parishes, that of hymns. Now, we won't sing you a Victorian hymn. I think you know them all very well. There's still very much staple repertoire for churches up and down the country, such as Abide With Me, the tune Eventide being written by ancient and modern's editor, William Henry Monk. I should also mention that the Oxford movement and the Tractarians had a huge impact on church music from the 1830s onwards, leading to choirs and organs being placed in the chancel rather than at the West End, where the 1816 organ was placed, when they replaced the psalm singers. They would have all been up on a gallery. There was a gallery back there, and an organ and the singers would be back at the West End. Towards the end of the 19th century, music would have been heard in the Priory by composers that you will recognise, such as John Stainer, Hubert Parry, Charles Villiers Stanford. But earlier in the century, there were composers such as Walmsley and Sterndale Bennett, who were producing music that fulfilled a purpose, even if it's fair to say it wasn't always of the highest calibre. However, we're gonna sing a lovely little bit now of Sterndale Bennett. It's from his anthem, God is a Spirit. a bit rude by, uh, about that, wasn't I? It's quite nice music. It's sort of simple and uh, fulfills its purpose, which is important. Now, with the founding of the Littleton Sunday School in 1817 at the northeast corner of the Priory Glebe, all was set in motion for what became the Littleton Grammar School, from where singing boys were taken for choir duties in the Priory. And singing was one of the six courses of instruction advertised at the school 
in 1879, and the Priory's choir master would have overseen the daily rehearsing of the boys, as well as the directing of the choir in services. In 1886, the Littleton buildings were enlarged, and the choir had exclusive use of the downstairs choir room, and mention is made that year of 19 choristers from the school. It would appear that the total number of singers in the Priory Choir numbered between 32 and 39 during the 1870s. The organist at the Priory from 1850 until 1893 was one William Haynes. Now his nephew, Battison Haynes, was a chorister here. And there he is. You'll see in this photo he's, de he's dedicated it to his uncle. So that was William the organist from his affectionate nephew, Battison Haynes. Uh, he was known to have deputised here on the organ as well while he was a chorister. Here is a little section of an organ piece by him, Meditation, and Michael is going to play that on the organ. In 1861, the organ had been moved from the West End to the chancel here, and in both 1862 and 1880, this had been enlarged. Now that there was a fine and large Nicholson instrument in place, an organ recital series was begun in 1896, where the then organist Charles de Souza presented a programme including works by Bach, Handel, Mendelssohn and Smart. In 1904, Frederick Wadeley was appointed organist and choirmaster. He stayed for only six years, but then remained in post in Carlisle Cathedral until 1960. Although written during his Carlisle years, we're going to sing an Arnus Day now from his pen. Wadley's success at the Priory was one Louis Hammond, and he was to re remain here in post for 36 years 
a record I'm unlikely to break. The musical standard at the Priory was reported to have been of a very high standard. Hammond was known to many of the musical cognoscenti, including cathedral organists and composers such as Herbert Brewer and Alfred Hollins. He was something of a Renaissance man, an organist, musician, and artist, and we are forever in his debt for his curating and cataloguing the windows and protecting them from the Second World War. He also composed, and we do sing his evening canticles in B-flat. We're not going to sing the whole canticle, but I think you should hear the Gloria. It's rather fine, um, Stanford-like. So here's the Gloria from his canticles. After the Littleton Grammar School's closure in 1946, and you probably guess we're getting towards the end, and Dr. Hammond's retirement, it must have been difficult to maintain the standard of music in the Priory, but music has continued and thrived under a series of fine organists, beginning with John Durham Hall, who stayed in post until 1974. And so I have been in post for 11 years having arrived here in 2012 and have thoroughly enjoyed continuing the great tradition of music in worship that has been here for nearly a thousand years. And now, looking around, um, I have my doubts that many of us will be around in 2085 to celebrate the real millennium of the Priory. So it's been lovely to have cheated a little and to have presented this 938th anniversary <laughs> celebration. Of course, an evening like this, I need to thank many people. And first of all, my thanks go to Ian Simcock, who really helped with the Benedictine plane chant. It's wonderful we have someone so expert, very close by. Catherine Little for her wonderful photos of the Priory windows. Do please look out for the new edition of her book as well on the Priory. Dr. David Cooper, one of my illustrious predecessors in the post, I used his book, The Littleton, which is the go-to reference for the grammar school and the Priory choirs. And I should also thank the singers who have, uh, I hope you've enjoyed their singing, our singing, we have thoroughly enjoyed it, um, working our way from Benedictine from Hockett. It's not often that you get to sing Hockett and Hammond in one evening. And I must also thank my wife who has sat there patiently scrolling through all the, uh, all the slides. Now finally to end, I thought you wouldn't mind hearing a little bit of Maxim. We should end the evening with a grace. So we're going to sing a grace and this is a piece I wrote in the first or second year of my tenure here. Um, and it's to give thanks to God, of course, for this wonderful place and for music. Um, and to send you on your way. Don't forget we've got canopies. I bet you haven't forgotten. Um, you're going to enjoy those hugely, I'm sure. But let us just finish with, uh, Lord, give us grace.
one thing for the rest of everybody as well. Well, what a treat. Um, I've learned such a lot. And what gems you've shared with us. The sound just soars in this building. Mm. The acoustics are just wonderful. Um, thank you so much, all of you. It's been a very special evening, and I think everyone has really enjoyed it. And we're going to carry on enjoying being in this building. There's drinks and canapes. Uh, so thank you to the canapé ladies, um, Rachel and Sally and the canapé queens. They're just beautiful. I've taken pictures, or someone's taken pictures of them. Um, they're, they're just so lovely. Um, so um, do stay on. Um, I know there's rugby at 8 o'clock, but, you know, <laughs> forget that. <laughs> yeah, I booked this a year ago. I didn't realise what an auspicious day it was. But it is a very auspicious day because it's somebody's birthday today. And I don't think we've finished singing, so I think we could have a bit of congregational um, audience participation um, if we could sing Happy Birthday to Piers. <laughs> so... Um, In do. the yes, audience, indeed. I think this is this is brilliant. So, um, do help yourself to drinks which are served over there. Um, there are leaflets for joining the friends. Let me just give the friends of Morgan Priory a little plug. If you haven't joined already, do think about it because um, they are very involved in the life of the church as well as um, providing funds for different projects. So, um, do think about joining. Take a leaflet away with you. Um, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I love that. Thank you all.